Director Wes Anderson is here. He first came to our attention in 1996 with his critically acclaimed debut film, Bottle Rocket. The chairman of Walt Disney Pictures, Joe Roth, was such a fan of the movie, he made sure Wes Anderson made his next film for Disney. That film is Rushmore. It is generating a great deal of buzz surrounding its February 5th release. The film focuses around the life of a prep school misfit and his efforts to win over a teacher. I am pleased to have Wes Anderson here to talk about this film. Well, Thank you very uh, much. What's interesting about Rushmore uh, is, is that for me, it, it is sort of come out of nowhere to, to sort of have this buzz about it. Uh, why is that? Well, the other movie we made, um, almost no one saw. So I think that contributes to the out of nowhere. Sure. Didn't, it, it didn't explode at the box office. No, it was released very, very quietly. And um, it sort of built up a little cult following eventually. But, yeah. um, but it had to, a few fans that were in the movie business, like Roth, who kind of set us up uh, with Disney. Um, and then the other thing, the movie doesn't have a lot of stars. It's got Bill Murray, who's playing a supporting role, but most of the other people are sort of new faces. Um, so I think it was kind of a surprise to some people. Your lead was, I mean, you looked a long time to find somebody, and then this guy just walks in and you say, magic. Yeah, right. We, had, we, we looked for a year trying to cast this part, because it was the kind of thing where the whole movie is riding on the shoulders of this kid. Uh, you know, it's a the character's 15 years old. And... Um, and we had looked all over America. We looked in Canada. We had casting directors. I went through, went through four rounds of casting directors in L.A. and I had them all over the place. Yeah. And at one point, we were even looking in England, even though the character is American, because we were thinking that he would be, we were thinking like it could be a kid doing a fake English accent, which would actually be a real English accent because we'd be using an English actor. And we were desperate. We were just coming up with really bizarre ideas. Um, and then finally, this kid, Jason Schwartzman, uh, walked in. And I just knew within about three minutes that we could actually make the movie, that we weren't going to have to well, shut down. What did he have operation. that made you so euphoric? Well, I think the main things were, the first thing is, I mean, I've done, the other movie we did is almost all with unknown, or people who just weren't actors, non-actors. And so I'd kind of experienced, had some experience with casting those kind of, you know, people. And it's a thing where as soon as they start playing a scene, you can tell if they can be real or not. Yeah. Some, you know, they can either do it or not. And then beyond that, it was that, this, and he was very real. And then the other thing was he just had a real instant intelligence and energy and sort of a force, which was going to be very important because the character does some awful things, and I still want us to be with him and pulling for him, you know, and it needed someone who would kind of, you know, bring the audience along and they would stay with them. Um, so. Was Murray an easy sale? Um, Murray was... But what you're happened? not paying him big bucks. No, we couldn't pay him. That's, we, we wrote it for him. And, but we thought we weren't going to get him because we thought we couldn't afford him. We thought we wouldn't be able to get to him, get him to read it or any of that kind of stuff. And um, what ended up happening was his agents knew the script and his agents were fans. So they put it in front of him and we had a couple other mutual friends who kind of promoted us to him. Yeah. And so then what happened was a week after we gave it to him, he called me and, um, and he called me, you know, he sort of said hello. And then he started talking about this Kurosawa movie called Redbeard. Right. Um, which is about a doctor, and we spoke for about an hour about uh, Redbeard, which I had no idea what it had to do with anything that uh, we were discussing. And at the end of it, he said, yeah, I think I'll do, uh, I'll do Rushmore with you, yeah. And you don't quite know why he said it. You just knew that he had had an opportunity to talk about yeah. Curious Yeah, he wanted, he wanted to talk about Redbeard <laughs> at that moment. So <laughs> You'd seen discussed. Redbeard. I, I hadn't seen Redbeard. You hadn't seen it. He was telling me I needed to see it, oh, and then I he see. took me on a tour of Redbeard. And right. then I saw it. And then I still don't get it. You know, so. <laughs> Have you told him you don't get it and you don't quite understand it? And what's I think, the problem here? I think I, I think I just did. You did. <laughs> I think you did too. Uh, roll tape. This is Murray on this program tonight talking about you. He was nervous to be working with you. You know that. I don't know that. That's true. He told read me. it. I mean, everything oh. I read, I believe. <clears throat> well, he fears me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, he, it would come up. I mean, he really was wanted to create this working relationship with you and would whisper and talk softly and sort of... Well, he's if, a film if student. If he wanted you to do it over, he wouldn't make a big scene about it. Right. Well, that's, that's good manners. You know, that's tact. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's learned that from the really great directors operate that way. They don't shout out at you. The, the bozos shout it out. Do it louder <laughs> and, uh, and, and don't scratch your nose when you do it. All right, roll again. You know, they, they, they talk <laughs> yeah. like that. But the, the soft guys and the smart ones and the great ones come up and they go... And they, 
It's just yeah. very private thing. So I read the script, but the script was so precisely written. I mean, uh, you could tell that this guy knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. You knew exactly what he wanted to make, exactly how he wanted each scene to go. And I, I've never really seen one that was that precise. I, I looked at it and I went, this is different. This guy knows exactly what he's doing, and I, I'll go with it. Anybody that can write that well, I feel confident in. Were you, were you intimidated by him? I, well, I was, before I met him, I was a little terrified. Terrified. Yeah, because I'd heard stories about him, about, you know, if, at first you know that he's a guy who can walk uh, into a crowd of people and take control of it in a way that I never could. You know, he's, he's, he's really funny, he's, everyone loves him already, and, um, and he's big and everything. Um, and, um, and then I'd also heard about, you know, him throwing someone in a lake on one thing, and I'd heard, you know, that he could, you know, if he, if he didn't like the situation, he's, you know, he's going to... Could fix be a it killer. in his way, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was scared before I met him. As soon as I met him, I felt so comfortable with him. I felt he was so he was he was so intelligent, and he was so clearly getting involved with us for all the right reasons. And he wanted and he wanted to do what we wanted to do. And then I just realized everything that I was afraid of, I can use all that stuff. He's going to bring that to to this, and you know, and we can benefit from it. Is directing hard? I you know. It's, there, it's, it, if you're a shy person, I think there are parts of it where, you're, where it's a little scary. I mean, like, I'm not a very, um, I'm not necessarily that outgoing in general, and you've got to be when you're doing a movie. You know, you've got all these people. But it's such a nice feeling when you get this group together and you're all kind of working on the same thing together. And most of it is, I mean, it's a nice, the other good feeling is that when, when we're doing a movie, I happen to know that I'm the one who does have all the answers to every question they're going to ask because I prepared all this stuff and I know the script better and I've worked on it all this time and I have ideas for how I want it to be. Um, so I f can take just an automatic confidence knowing that I, that I have the right answers. Um, but it's important things. that you have the right answers and it's important that they at least think you do. That's true. That's true. And I think a lot, and also, you know, the people like like the movie we, the first movie did Bottle Rocket. I used all the same crew from Bottle Rocket, um, you know, all the same department heads, the cameraman and the production designer and the editor and all those people. So they know me and they've worked with me. So the new people who come on sort of look to them, and see the way they look at the, to me, and that can kind of help set the tone of things also. Because what I want it to be is everyone feeling like they're. I don't. I, it's not going to work. It's like an authoritarian kind of thing because that's just not my. Style. That's not really who I am. I don't think I could carry that so off. So, what's at all. the hardest thing? The hardest. Well, the 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 scariest thing with this one was that I was putting together with the other movie we did. The cast was all a group of friends, and we, the movie sort of was the movie came together because we were a group of mm. people who wanted to do a movie. With this one, I had to assemble a cast of people, and there were. There were some of them were very experienced actors like Bill Murray and uh, Seymour Cassell, who's in it, and this English actor Brian Cox, and then some of them were newcomers. But I wanted it to be a group of people who would come together and become friends. It's a movie that's sort of about friendship, and I wanted that kind of feeling on the set. And I, and so and I was worried about how that would happen, how they would interact, and it came together very nicely. Um, but it was the thing that caused me the most anxiety, I think. You, University of Texas. Yeah. You make a student film, so to speak, what, an 18-minute short. Mm -hmm. what, we effectively, what we affectionately call battle rockets around here, we do call <laughs> bottle rockets, so we'll give you the benefit of the doubt that it is, in fact, bottle rocket. Uh, you made 18 minutes, and you showed it to somebody, and, and I guess it was Jim Brooks who saw it at Sundance or somewhere and said... Yeah, well, what actually happened was we had the movie, we took it to Sundance, and nothing happened at Sundance. Then this producer, Polly Platt, who worked for Jim Brooks... Right. Um, she saw it, and she saw a tape of it in our script. She brought it to Jim, and Jim saw it, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with this. <laughs> and Jim saw it and read it, and it's, and it's always a, a shock to me when somebody can just look at something and they don't care about what... I mean, so much of stuff in the movie business is people reacting to what other people want, you know, yeah. what right. bidding wars and all that stuff. And this was one guy, the only guy who wants it, saying, we're going to do this. And that's the same with Bill. You know, Bill just read this script cold, and he made all his own decisions mm. about it. Um, 
And you know, when Brooks and Polly Platt uh, got involved, that sort of just set us up to, to, to work in the movies. You know what else can happen too, and I'm sure this must have happened at some point, somebody, you can do something and somebody can get it and they can see something that they know is really good. And while they know, somebody might come in the room and say, that is the worst 18 minutes I've ever seen. And they're saying, yeah, yeah, I understand what's wrong with the film, but did you see this? And anybody who can do this has a real gift and we can take that and grow it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, this is a clip called Can't Do It, Max. Um, tell me a little bit about Max, because he's an interesting character. Well, Max is this kid who, um, this was like the center of the movie for us. The reason we wrote the movie was because we came up with this character, um, me and my co-writer, Owen Wilson. Yeah. Um, and he is this kid who, um, he runs everything in this school. He goes to a prep school called Rushmore. He, he, he's founded all these clubs and societies, kind of runs everything. He puts on, a big part of it is he puts on these big, giant plays. Like, he's done an adaptation of, Serpico that he's putting on these, uh, he's done like a big Vietnam play, these things are like very influenced by TV and movies. And, um, he's, but he's also a horrible student, he's on the verge of getting kicked out, and, um, and he's on scholarship, which he lies about and tells people his father's a neurosurgeon. Yeah, and he's also applying to Oxford with Harvard as a fallback, safety. as a yeah. safety fallback. Right, right. How much of this in your head is you? I, I, I don't really think of it that way. I mean, I think... That there are parallels. There are parallels, yeah. I mean, uh, for me and Owen, my co-writer, both. The stuff we draw, like the school where we filmed is my school, and the plays that he puts your, on... Your school in Houston. Yes, my school in Houston. That's where we shot it. Um, and, um, and the plays that he puts on are sort of inspired by some plays I put on when I was very young. But other than that, it's more like, I think, if I had seen this movie when I was 15 years old, I would have, that would have been my movie, that would have been the, the I would have, it would have changed me. Yeah. Um, it would have been, a, it, because I think it's like a role model for, it's like a kid who, it shows you a way to be heroic and still be a horrible student and get rejected from all your schools and fail in all kinds of ways but succeed in other ways and I didn't really have an idea of how to kind of put, do that and I was going to get rejected and I was going to do terribly, so. Roll tape, here's a scene called, uh, between Max and uh, Brian Cox, Dr. Guggenheim. Dr. Guggenheim, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but the fact is, no matter how hard I try, I still might flunk another class. If that means I have to stay on for a postgraduate year, then so be it. But we don't offer a postgraduate year. Now explain this to me. I mean, he seems like the way he talks is a smart kid. Right. Yeah. He but he's a, failing. He's a smart kid. I think he's deeply disturbed in, in a lot of ways. And he's also probably one of those kids who's very verbal. But he probably will never be able to do math, you know. <laughs> He's one of those kind of people. Uh, this relationship between you and Owen Wilson, what's this collaboration about? I mean, you seem to be joined at the hip. Yeah, well, I, Owen and I have been friends for about 10 years, and uh, we went to school together, and all our whole sort of, however long we've been working and doing movies and everything, has been together. Um, and I just sort of feel like there's nobody else. That I, I know my work is going to be better if I'm writing with him. And there's, I've never met anybody who else who I would want to write with. And I feel like our sort of sensibility and our sense of humor is so similar. The things that we're attracted to in characters and stories and behavior and things are just so close um, that I just, it just seems like, you know, I just feel lucky. I feel I'm lucky, you know, I'm lucky to have him. All right. Oh, just one more time. Take a look at oh, one other clip from this film called Want Me to Grab a Dictionary. This is the infamous in this movie, Miss Cross, who Max has his eye on, and so does uh, Bill Murray's character. Take a look. The truth is, neither one of us had the slightest idea where this relationship is going. We can't predict the future. We don't have a relationship, Max. But we're friends. Yes, and that's all we're going to be. That's all I meant by relationship. You want me to grab a dictionary? You and Wilson write this together? How did the collaboration work in terms of the process of writing? Well, the way we the way we usually work is we start out just talking, and um, usually we're traveling or something like that, and we're talking and talking and talking about the characters, and telling stories. You know, we both have a hundred stories that we know of each other. You know, and then we have stories of things that happened to us together, people that we've kind of watched, and that stuff all starts to kind of mix together, and we talk, and then we start just writing on little scraps of paper which we trade back and forth. And I'll write something out, and then I'll get it back from Owen, and I'll have big X's through it, and uh, things scribbled, and, uh, and we rewrite each other's stuff. And, um, and then eventually, I start typing it. Um, the bad thing is, when I, like, if Owen gives me something and I type it, 
if I don't like part of it, I just, I just don't type it, I just erase it. But if I give Owen something, he puts an X through it, which is so much more, so much more aggressive and seems so much ruder than just erasing it. Are these defining personality traits? Uh, the defining personality trait is that I have learned to type and he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> you have to write your own scripts? I mean, so far, everything you've made, you've written. Yeah. It's two. Right, it's two. <laughs> but, so, uh, it, it, I, I mean, it feel, I, I, I haven't read anything that felt, I mean, these, these are pretty personal movies. Like, this movie, Rushmore, is very personal to me and Owen. It's, what does that mean, personal? It's got enough, it's got so many little things that connect to our own lives, you know? The characters come so much from people that we've known and, um, and from little aspects of ourselves. And the setting is so familiar to us. They're, they're, and, they're, and then there's sort of thematic stuff that's personal to us. And I just don't think there's any way that I would find a script that would mean as much to me. You say thematic stuff that's personal to us. What do you mean? I mean, like, the kid, in the, the kid that the movie's about is someone who he doesn't try, you, you know, like in high school, one of the central things is to be cool. Yeah. And this is a kid who's not cool at all, but who is, uh, who, uh, but who is, um, he has his own ideas of the way he wants to be, things he wants to kind of accomplish. And he has this great enthusiasm for those things and this kind of drive about it and a resilience. And, and I sort of kind of, that, that's something that means something to us. I mean, I like people who are, who are kind of unusual characters and kind of originals. And, um, Do we think Max is going to be successful in life? I think... He's like headed for Broadway or something, you know. <laughs> Do he's we? gonna like hook up with Mike Nichols or somebody like yeah. that. He'll become a protege of someone, and he'll and he'll. Yeah. Speaking know. of Mike Nichols, uh, he's a hero. Yeah. Because. Well, I you know I I've loved uh, a number of his uh, you know I've I've loved lots of his movies, and and some somehow The Graduate is a movie that Owen and I have gotten into our consciousness in a way where whenever we write a script we end up feeling like we just stole a hundred things from The Graduate and we can't point out what they are. But we feel like there's like so, some sort of tonal thing or something. It's just like, uh, it just seems to be a part of it. And then there is stuff that I over have overt overtly stolen also. Overtly? Yeah. yeah. What's the best example of that? Well, there's a scene where Bill Murray is having this, his, uh, his twin sons who he despises are having a, it's their birthday party. In the middle of the birthday party, he climbs up on the high dive and does a cannonball into the swimming pool. And he stays underwater by himself and there's just sort of a lonely moment of him all by himself in the, in the swimming pool which is you know there's a scene in The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman is in they, his parents give him a wetsuit a scuba diving thing and he's just by himself at the bottom of the pool and it's, that's what's from. Uh, who else anybody else in your pantheon of heroes that are directors that sort of make this yeah uh, a lot I mean a guy who I keep thinking about is is Polanski who uh, Roman Polanski Roman Polanski because of what film a lot of it is because of Rosemary's Baby and the way he shot it, um, because it's a movie where it's a it's a horror movie, but the the performances are all totally real, and there's this, and it's also sort of a comedy, and there's a sort of strange it's just a little off from reality. You know, the behavior is all real, but there's something about everything in the movie that feels like just a little off, which is kind of setting you up for the fact that eventually it's going to be it's going to go crazy. I thank you very much. Wes. Thank you, Pleasure. Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.